All right, let's stand just for a minute. Take your Bible. Say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I'll never be the same. Never, never, never. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Welcome for any of us, any uh, joining us on Facebook Live as well or YouTube. We welcome you here at the Tabernacle in Brookings, South Dakota, USA. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, let me, let me. India says hello. We bless you, India, in Jesus' name. Praying for South India and the many leaders that we know there. And uh, we stand with you in Jesus Christ for God's blessings on your lives and meeting your needs and expanding the outreach there in India for his glory. Hallelujah. All right, we're going to the book of Luke just to start there again. We just, we just had uh, the Lord's Supper here celebrating what Christ has done. And again, it's so significant, you know. He took the bread and he gave thanks. He said, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. And so we're actually, we're actually taking a, a time in history now before we're remembering the Passover, always the Passover. And they're actually, actually, this is a Passover meal, <laughs> ironically. And so, and so now Jesus is saying, I want you to remember me. So now we're going forth into a new covenant, into a new testament, all right? We're going into a new testament. And he says, this, after the supper, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. So a New Testament. Amen? Not an Old Testament. It's a New Testament. Just like my dad's will that we showed, the last will and testament of Robert Kaufman. Shows his name here and so forth. What he's testifying, what he wants done, what he wants done with his, whatever's his, whatever assets and so forth are his. Jesus went to the cross, paid all of our debts, he had no debts, paid all of our debts, and then he gave us, he gave us all his promises, and he gave us the Holy Spirit, and he gave us all these things so that we can walk in a divine nature, not a fallen nature anymore, but in a divine nature, to walk in victory. So many Christians just struggle, they struggle in their lives because they, they're not even aware, they haven't read the will, you know, you have to know, you have to read the will to know what's in the will, Right? If you don't read the will, and of course, if you had a rich relative, believe me, you know, uh, like they say, where there's a will, there's a relative. If you had a rich relative, you'd want to know what's in the will. And the only way you're going to know that is by reading it. And then once you read it, it becomes a legal document when the person is gone so that now you know what is yours. Right? So if you didn't read it and if you didn't go and claim it, you may never get it. So the same thing biblically. Now, we go, we go to the book of, of Hebrews chapter 7 now. And then it says, he kept, he, in keeping with the oath's greater strength and force, Jesus has become a guarantee of a better, stronger agreement, more excellent and more advantageous covenant. So Jesus is the guarantee through his blood, through the precious blood of Jesus. Let me just tell you, there's power in the blood. And, and we overcome through the blood of the Lamb. And so because of that, we live in this brand new agreement, Amen. whole different way. Now, before Old Testament, you know, there was God who's holy and man who's sinful, no buffer. New Testament, we have a mediator now, Jesus Christ. He paid the price for all humanity now, Amen. not just you and I, not just for a select group of people. Some, so we have whole denominations that believe that just some people are, are, are predestined to be saved. Not true. He wants everybody to get saved. The Bible says he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to eternal life. It's because he paid the price for them. So we, our part is to receive what he's done. All right? So now we go from there. We go to Hebrews chapter 8. And then it says this. He has obtained a more excellent ministry, but how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. 
So why live in the old when you can live in the new? Why even, why even want to hang on to old? People love tradition, but let me just tell you, that's all tradition. That's old. So, so hang on to the new. Hang on to Jesus. Hang on to his promises. Hang on to the Holy Spirit. All the things that are the new. And thank God for that. That we don't have rules, all these other rules and regulations and so forth that we're, that we're supposed to live by. But now we're living in a brand new covenant, a new testament that he's given to us. Amen? So we go in Hebrews chapter 9 then. Hebrews chapter 9, he's the mediator of the new covenant by means of death. For the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Now, even here, when a person dies in the, in the natural, all right, even here now, when a person dies, all their debts are settled. So whatever's in their estate, all those debts are settled before anybody gets anything else. All right? So if they have lots of debts, whatever, whatever's sold and so forth pays those first, then what's left can go to any heirs. Jesus paid for our debts. I'm so glad about that. He paid for our debts. He, he had no debts. He took our debt upon him. Amen. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sin away. And that's, that's yeah, I sing a brand new song because it's amazing grace what Christ has done for us that we could not do. See, to this day, folks, it's not how good you become. I'm, beginning to, I'm a better, better, better Christian and so forth, like I'm working my way that way. No, it's all because of his grace. Yes we, we, yes, we obey. Yes, we have works of righteousness in that sense. Yes, but we're not working our way to heaven. Once you're in the family, once you're in the family, you're an heir. All right, you're an heir to, to in the sense, the spiritual sense, you're an heir to the father. My dad had four boys. Now, various times in life, none of us, uh, all of us at various times didn't really act very good. <laughs> but we were still his boys. Right? You, you know, you don't disinherit your children. So in Christ, we become heirs to what he has. So then it says, wherewith there's a testament. There's a testament. There must also be a necessity, the death of the testator. So when you write a will, you are the testator. You are saying, you're alive. You're saying you're of a, of a sound mind. You're saying, this is what I want to be done with my assets when I'm gone. You're the testator, all right? This is a testament. Understand that? Okay, when, when the testator dies, there must be the death of the testator. Then the testament is in force. After men are dead, since there's no power while at all while the testator lives. So while I'm alive, and I have a will, while I'm alive, it's just a sheet of paper. And we have declarations on it, what we want done. All right? It's just a sheet of paper. But when I die, it becomes a legal document. Now this cannot be changed. No one can throw it out and say, well, I don't believe that. We're not going to do that. No, 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 no. It's a legal document. It's a legal document. So my chair, my heirs, my children, and so forth, all those heirs, no, that's a legal document. This is the same thing biblically. Amen. When Christ died for our sins, his word came into force for all of us, for all humanity. And so we have a New Testament written by, inspired by the Holy Ghost for us today so that we can live our lives by it. We're not children of the old, we're children of the new. We don't prophesy out of the old like old people do, you know, old covenant. We saw a prophecy online again yesterday. Judgment, judgment on America, judgment, judgment. I'm just, I'm so, I'm so amazed. Coming from Christians that speak in tongues and so forth, they get a word from God and I'm thinking, no, you don't, you have no word from God. You know why? Because it's not in the will. It's not there. God can't give you what he doesn't have. Amen. He interacts with us different today than he did, you know, 2,000 plus years ago. So the more we know what's in the will, 
the more assured we can become of what we're hearing. Many Christians just follow who they listen to, the famous preacher or whatever. That person hears from God. They're famous. They got a big church. Whatever you hear, you better discern. Just like we here would say, don't believe anything other than what comes through the word. Check it out. But we're in a new covenant. So therefore, we cannot prophesy like the old. Is judgment coming someday? Yes. When Christ comes and the world is judged, yes. But right now is a time of grace. It's a time he's trying to reach people and love people and bring them in. Jesus is not out to kill people. Never, ever, ever, if there's a tornado, if there's a hurricane, if there's an earthquake, if there's uh, some calamity, tragedy, or whatever. Never, ever, ever, New Testament, is that God? Not God. We're in a New Testament. So the sad thing is, is that you, we have Christians see, and we have Christian leaders talking about things that happens and so forth. And I remember the, the last big earthquake in Oakland, in California. And I was flying out the next day to Brazil. So this happened during the World Series in 1989. And I'm sitting by a businessman in the plane who was shaken. I mean, emotionally shaken because his plane was the last plane to leave the runway at Oakland. And he flew into Minneapolis and now he was flying to Miami. I was flying to Miami. And he talked about that earthquake and this and that. And I shared, had a chance to share Jesus with him and pray with the guy. Now, the problem, the problem, though, when people say immediately, people say, judge, see, there's judgment on San Francisco. But it didn't hit any gay districts. It hit churches. Had a friend's church that cracked and so forth. Tons, hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage. Oh, it didn't hit, the, didn't hit the gay district. Damaged churches, killed Christians. And somehow I always think, he must have had a bad aim. Must, God must have had a bad aim. When the earthquake or the, the hurricane hit New Orleans and people say it's judgment on Bourbon Street, judgment is, you know, for Mardi Gras and so forth, and it didn't hit Bourbon Street. Bourbon Street didn't flood. Oh, he must have had a bad aim. But I remember there's a big church, big Pentecostal church, assembly church in, in New Orleans, and the church was destroyed. Had thousands of members destroyed. Oh, he must have had a bad aim. No. Let me tell you something. If God does anything in judgment, it's like a surgeon. It's just cloop, cloop, cloop. real easy to do. Okay, you're done. Click. Not killing. He's not out to kill people. He's out to save people. Amen. Incidentally, that's why it's amazing to me. Many, many horrendous, terrible, awful dictators through history live long lives. Mao Zedong in China murdered millions, lived a long life. Pol Pot in Cambodia, they slaughtered two million people, lived a long life, died in the jungle in his 80s. Lenin lived a long life. So you find people, you find people that, that uh, uh, Idi Amin in Africa lived a long life. See, people say, well, boy, people are so quick to hop on the judgment bandwagon and think, wait a minute, I beg to differ. Why did these people even live a long life? Well, maybe by accident, maybe they had good genes, but also God still wanted to save them. Amen. Until their dying breath, there's hope. Amen. When we die and we breathe our last, if we don't know Jesus, there's no hope. It's over. There's not a purgatory. Why is there no purgatory? Because there's no purgatory in the Bible. Okay? No purgatory in the Bible, therefore there's... No purgatory. I could, I could make up a lot of things and stuff and make it sound good, but I guess we're going to stick with what the Word says, right? So we're New Testament, we're New Testament Christians. And once there's the death of the testator, who in this case was Jesus Christ, and he is the mediator of this new covenant, now this testament is in force. You know, someone, someone could say, say, you know, Pastor Dave, I don't even believe that. It really doesn't matter what you believe. 
Doesn't matter, still the Word. The Word of God doesn't change. So it's not based on what you believe or what someone else believes. No, it's just based on that's it. This is the Word of God. There isn't another book. There isn't another way to heaven. This would go against some people's theology. I understand that. But Jesus is the way to heaven. If you're listening right now, if you're Hindu, I just want you to know Jesus loves you very much. Jesus Christ loves you. He cares for you. And he's as close as the mention of his name. But wherever you're at right now, probably this is on your phone, but wherever you're at, you can just say Jesus. Just say Jesus. Just say, Jesus, reveal yourself to me. You know what? He will. He will reveal to you who he is and how much he loves you. So good. So good. So we have these things that, that you know, are amazing to us, but the only way we're going to know them is by reading the will. That's why we emphasize Bible reading. Amen? Why we, even our Bible reading schedule, you do the Old Testament once, the New Testament twice. Love it. Okay, last thing here, we'll review. 2 Corinthians 3. 2 Corinthians 3, 16 just says, he's made us able ministers of the New Testament. So, I mean, folks, the simplicity of the Word of God is wonderful. You know, because people, people say, oh, Pastor Dave, but this is, this is important. You know, we still got to look at Passover. And, Woo, we still got to blow the show for it. Woo, we got to do all these. Things. No, 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 you don't. I'm sorry. He made us an able minister of the New Testament. He didn't say, he didn't say old and new. He didn't say Bible. He said new. Say new. He made us a minister of the New Testament. Not, not of the old letter, of all that, he says, but of the Spirit. The letter kills, the Spirit gives life. So there was no life under the law. There was no life under that legal system. There's no life under that, that sort of judgment type stuff. But there is life in the Spirit. Amen. That's why anybody I see, no matter who the person is, we were offering them life. Amen. You know, we're not pointing the finger like we're so holy and so forth, and all where they're going to go. No, we're pointing, we're, if we draw a pointing finger, we're saying, Jesus loves you. <laughs> you know, yesterday I was watching college football game day for a little bit, and I loved it. I don't even know how it happened, because I know on game day, they kind of screen all the big signs that come into the perimeter. They have these announcers, and in the back were thousands of college students and so forth. But, but in Two places, they had this huge sign about, it said, Jesus, you know, and Jesus loving you, and Jesus didn't come to condemn you. Jesus came to give you life, and I'm thinking, woo, hallelujah. That was a good message. I was so thankful it wasn't saying, repent, repent, you know, your sins, you know, you're going to die. What was. I'm so, the message was great, and ESPN just stayed on it, stayed on it, stayed on it. I bet it showed it, at least while I was watching, at least 20 times, the message. It was wonderful. Another message came up about Jesus again and his love, and he'd say, follow Jesus. You know, only Jesus can, can touch your life, or forget the exact wording, but remember, it's Jesus and not, your, not church. Well, that's important, right? Got something there? So, so the message, the message we want to portray to the world is, is who? God is good, Right? That's the message we're trying to portray. This mic is on now. Steve. Hallelujah. I just have to splice something in here. So, you know, people are uh, quite irritated about all the texts that you're getting. And, you know, is everyone getting texts, spam texts? A lot of you. Is anybody? Okay. <laughs> and, um, you know, hi, hi, uh, hi, Susie. Or hi, Doc. Did your puppy get the medicine? I mean, just... Funny, strange ones, right? That's what's coming to my phone. But anyway, so um, here's something that quiets to them, and it's just so beautiful. Um, I do answer back, but I say, have you ever prayed the life prayer and asked Jesus to come into your life? There you <laughs> asked go. Jesus to come into your heart? Once in a while, I get a response, and uh, usually they're, they're all finished with what I with my phone number. So, yeah. Um, so anyway, we don't have to get too mad or irritated or bugged or uh, carnal about it, but um, just say a prayer for, I believe for the most part, it's a human being. Probably. Sending, sending it. They're fishing. 
And, um, but somebody can read that name, Jesus. Yeah. And, you know, what you said, we're offering him life and love. That's right. That's right. So just offer him life and love and not anger and irritation. That won't help anyone. That's right. And it, won't, it doesn't help us either. So anyway, that's been kind of fun to do that. Amen. Yeah, amen. Jeannie does better than that than me. I was going, delete. She's, uh, she's thinking better than I am. So that's, that's good. That's very good. All right, John 17, 4. John 17, 4, when Jesus was praying in the garden, and he said, uh, I have finished the work which you've given me to do. So, so uh, let me just say this. You should know that your life on this earth is temporary, that we're all terminal, all right? And we have in this life, we're here to praise God, live for the Lord, and so forth. And if he doesn't come back prior, we're going to exit this life. Anybody watching this, you should know your life is terminal. You might say, I just feel great. It's, you're still terminal. You have a moment on this earth, and compared to eternity, it's very short. It's like a vapor. You know, you see on the winter day, the vapor, and it's gone very short. Jesus knew his life. He had a mission, right? Now, he died quite young for us. But we should know in our own life that you have something to do, all right? And in the meantime, Jesus had a will. You should have a will also for what's going to happen after this life. Sometimes people just even think, well, I don't have anything. But if you have children, have a will. So you can designate where those children, who's going to raise those children if you should not be here, as a guardian, say. That's important, right? Yeah. It's very, very, very important to do that. We plan. There's nothing wrong with having insurance. Life insurance, all right? Why? Because we're going to lead this life. And especially if you're younger, to have some term insurance is a good thing as well. Why? Because you're going to leave this life. Right. Nothing wrong with that. It's really quiet here. We're not giving a, you know, a, these are good things to realize. The more you realize your mortality, the better you appreciate every day. So if I realize, wow, I don't know how long I've got, but I've got today. So it makes your conversations with your family, with your loved ones, people you meet more important. If you realize that, wow, I am planting something here for the future, I'm sowing seeds today that can grow tomorrow, and I don't know how long I have. People come, people come to funerals, and they talk, talk about people, oh, boy, boy, they were really nice, they were this, this. You ought to say that when they're alive. Yeah, right. right? You should say things, you should say appreciations and so forth while people are alive. Yeah. Think about it. Think about how we're sowing into people's hearts. Think about it for children or grandchildren. You squeeze them and you bless them. I'm always blessing. I'm always blessing grandchildren. Always bless them. Always squeezing them and so forth. Always having fun with them too. Turn to your neighbor and say, you should be fun. <laughs> should be fun. You know? So, so Jesus finished the work that the Father gave him. Now, on John, John 19, verse 30, now when it's exactly at the cross, he's finished praying here in the garden and so forth. And Jesus, when he died, he says, it's finished. I've done it. I've done it. I completed, I completed the job. He was the sp sinless, spotless lamb who died for us. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Because of that, we can have victory today. Because of that, we can have peace in our hearts today. Because of that, we can have peace with God. There was no peace with God under the old covenant. There is always under the new covenant. 1 John 3 then. So Jesus says this, or the Bible says this, that the devil sinned from the beginning for this purpose, the purpose, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Amen. Now, he didn't destroy the devil. He destroyed the operations of the devil. The devil is still around. But he destroyed the operations of the devil. What are the operations of the devil? That's sin, sickness, and poverty. So he destroyed those things so that we in this life yet can live a life of victory. 
don't have to live in bondage to sin. I don't have to live in sickness. I don't have to live in poverty. Now, it doesn't mean I haven't faced adversity, because if you know me through 42 years of ministry here, you know that we face those things. However, with the promises of God, we can face them with victory. So even though you might face sickness, or even though you might face poverty, and we face those things a lot, yet we can believe God and come out on victory's side. Someone the other day, someone the other day again just said, you know, well, I don't know all that the Lord's trying to teach me here, but, and they were going through all this bad stuff. And I'm thinking, what are you trying to teach you? If the Holy Spirit, if God is trying to teach you anything, it will be through his word. Amen. So listen, it's not through the circumstances of life. We all have circumstances of life, right? All right. But, but we learn through the word, Amen. through the word of God. Otherwise, people think, well, I had that car accident and so forth, and so I learned this. Well, I can show you all kinds of people that have had tragedies, and they're bitter, angry, will never serve God, maybe never come to a church again because they said God did it. Lots and lots of people. So we learn how? Through the Word of God. If I'm going to go to the campus of SDSU, and I'm going to, going to uh, learn chemistry. I'm going to probably learn through a book, right? I'm going to learn something, right? right? Isn't just like, oh, yeah, well, I'm sure we believe in air and you know, breathe air and do all that. You know, not just hocus pocus. You learn something tangible. Amen. Scripturally, we learn something tangible so we're not wacky people. Amen. We, should be, we should be, of course, very ordinary, but very supernatural people out here in the world to help the world. The world is lost. The world is spinning like a top. People are looking for answers. And most of the time in the wrong places. And most of the time they're not going to go to a church building maybe. So who are they going to see? They're going to see you, me, others that are believers and hear something good. Amen. Planting a seed. Amen. Right? Just talked to a businessman yesterday, just yesterday, we talked to a businessman, face, he has been a Christian and so forth, and facing divorce and all that, and we laid our hands on him and we blessed him, we spoke in his life. Amen. To try to do what? To believing the Lord loves this guy, wants to encourage him. See, we live in this New Testament, we have so much to give. So the purpose of Jesus was to destroy the operations of the devil so that we can might bring life to other people. Amen? Amen. So the prophecy then, we had small groups today, Psalm 103. Psalm 103, we have this prophecy here, David's prophesying, bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me. Forget not all his benefits. Well, these benefits, these benefits are benefits of the New Testament. All right? So we have old prophecies that come to light in the New Testament. All right? He forgives all your iniquities. He heals all your diseases. Redeems your life from destruction. Crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Satisfies your mouth, things to speak with good things. Why? We speak the word of God. So all these things help us then so that we're constantly renewed. Rather than beat down by the world, we're renewed by the spirit of God. Amen. So we can walk in this place of victory. Amen. It's an entirely different way of looking at things in the Bible if you look at it in the context of the Bible. Not, not, not. Not with the old, mixing the old, old t covenant with the new covenant. No, it's just the new covenant. And now we see these prophecies come to pass. You say, thank you, Jesus. Just like Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 was a prophetic word regarding Jesus Christ. And so he bore our griefs, our sicknesses, our weakness, our distress. He carried our sorrows, our pains, our punishment. We considered him stricken, smitten. We thought he was smitten. God, it was for us. He was wounded for our transgressions, verse 6. He was, he was uh, bruised for our iniquities and guilt. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with the stripes were healed and were made whole. All that was for us. This is a prophetic word that comes in the old. It's written in the old. That's true, but it's a prophetic word for the new. Amen. So we're living in this new covenant that now these, these realities come to pass. So that now in John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. And we can buy into it because we realize, wow, this is all new. Like, yes, this is mine today. I have come that you might have abundant life. 
Not a defeated life, not a beat down life, not a depressed life, discouraged life, a needy life, a poor life, poverty life, sick life. No, no, I've come that you might have life. The thief, the thief, of course, steal, kill, and destroy. That's the devil. But, but Jesus defeated or destroyed the operations of the devil so that we can live in this brand new testament. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So we go and we claim what is rightfully ours in Christ. Now, people might say, well, I don't deserve it. I know you don't deserve it. That's the wonderful thing about grace. <laughs> None of us deserve it, but he gave it to us. That's the thing about being a son and daughter in Christ is you're part of the family. I, I just got news for you. There's, he doesn't have black sheep. <laughs> he has sheep in his family. And he cares about every son and daughter that there is. And when we come into Christ, we come into the family, all of a sudden we're an heir. If you were a young parent and, you, and, and so you had a pregnancy and you had a newborn child and say, for some reason you left this life soon and you still had a baby, that baby is an heir of you, is an heir to what you have. That baby can't even speak for himself necessarily, but still is an heir of, of your assets in your life. We have adopted grandchildren in our family. Those grandchildren are heirs because when they came into our family, they became also legal heirs to all that is ours. So all that is Jeannie and I's and all the things that we have, when we leave this life and it's passed on, eventually it's going to get to our grandchildren. Grandchildren that weren't birthed naturally in our family, that but came to us, hallelujah, supernaturally, and are part of our family. They're in the family. You weren't born a Jew, but thank God for the blood of Jesus that he grafted you in. Thank you, Lord. And that we can live in his family, live in his kingdom. Incidentally, Jews have to be born again, too. You get people that go all different ways, you know, and so forth, and that say things and so forth. But just remember this, Jesus said to Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, you must be born again. <laughs> so even the Jews, everybody on this planet must be born again. Nobody gets a free ride. <laughs> Amen? So you make a choice. He, he, he extended his love to us for many years, I just walked by him. No way, no way, boy, no way. I'm not going to follow you. No way, I'm not going to do that. And then finally, finally, my eyes are open to my sin. The Savior I needed, I get saved. And what did I do? I receive now this love and grace. So I received the adoption that he gave to me. He welcomed me into the family with all the privileges and rights. I didn't even know what I was walking into, but I knew it was good. Amen. I was forgiven. I was free. I had peace. Amen. My life changed. Hallelujah. Changed inwardly, but changed outwardly. Amen. So we come to the book of Galatians in the fourth chapter of Galatians. Then when it talks about adoption, he sent forth the son for us. To redeem those who were under the law that might, we might receive the adoption as sons. God did this for us, for the world. It's extended out there. Now listen, this is for everybody. This is for anybody caught in a sin. This is for any, this is for Democrats and Republicans. This is for evil world leaders. This is for anybody. Terrorist. He commended his love for us while we were still enemies. So that we could be adopted. Now we have to choose to be adopted, right? We choose to say, yes, I want to be in your family. You're not accidentally going to become a Christian. You make a choice. Amen. You're not predestined like, well, we're going to predestine those to be Christians, but those no. No, everybody has a chance here. Hallelujah. To be in the family, to be part of this wonderful testament. This will that's given to us so, so we can receive the adoptions of sons because you are sons. God sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart. You can cry, Abba, Father. All of a sudden you realize, I love you, Jesus. Amen. That's why when I talk to people about being a Christian and people say, well, I belong to this church. I say, that's not what I asked you. Church can't save you. Church doesn't make you a Christian. There's only one who can, that makes you a Christian. That's Jesus Christ. That's the only way to become a Christian is by believing in Jesus Christ. That's the only way to get into heaven is through Jesus Christ. 
No other way. You could be baptized. You could be baptized 50 times. You could be confirmed 100 times. It doesn't matter. You have to know Jesus Christ. The dog tags that we wear, you fellowship a lot of places, but the dog tags we wear is Jesus Christ. Bought and paid for by Jesus Christ. So we receive the spirit of the Son into your hearts. I love you, Jesus. The spirit of Jesus is in me. (laughs) Have you ever felt down and discouraged and now I don't feel anything today? Well, open your mouth. Not hard now. Just open your mouth and start praising him. And what happens when you start praising God? Just turn off your TV and just start, just start praising him and just get a little loud. Say, thank you, Jesus. Well, I'll guarantee, you, I'll guarantee your atmosphere will change. You don't need a pill. You don't need a drug. You don't need a drink. All you got to do is humble yourself, open your mouth, start praising God. Boom. Things will change. I'll guarantee you light pushes back darkness. The darkness cannot stand the light. So anytime a Christian starts praising the Lord, the devil's like, ah, I can't stand it. (laughs) Why? Because that's the power of God. That's the light of the Lord. So you start praising him, Jesus in you, Christ in you, you're letting him out. The Holy Ghost. Out of your your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Going to come up, hallelujah. Where's it going to come? Out of your mouth. (laughs) Therefore, you're not a slave, but a son. We were slaves. We were slaves to sin. Now we're son of God. If a son, then an heir of God through Jesus Christ. We're an heir of all that God has. Think of this. All that God has, I'm an heir to it. It's mine. Thank you, Lord. It's mine. Hallelujah. Let me read this quick. 1 Corinthians 2. So the will, a will is not public a will is not public till a person dies. So once a person dies, then the will becomes public. Now, maybe your spouse knows or whatever. But, but publicly, the will isn't public. No one's going to know until you die what you did with your assets. Therefore, Old Testament, eye has not seen, nor has ear heard, nor has entered the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Old Testament. Why? Because it was all healed. Or it was hidden. It was all hidden. It was all secret. No one could see it. No one knew it. No one knew what was going on. But New Testament then, voila, we have a will. And we can read it. And then it says, but God has revealed, next verse, those revealed to them through his son's spirit, revealed them the things that he's prepared for us in his will. So New Testament's all revealed to us for the spirit searches the things that are God's so that we can know the things that are freely given to us of God. That's actually the next verse, verse 12. Let's look at verse 12. The spirit which is from God that we might know the things that are freely given to us by God. Can you see then why we emphasize Bible reading? Can you see why we emphasize being in your Bible? Why we, it's not like taking a, taking a, a vitamin like a scripture for the day and you read that one verse. That, that's, that's good. Maybe you can get along with it for a while, but you've got to have nourishment. If you don't feed yourself in the natural, you're going to become weak. If you don't feed yourself in the supernatural, you become weak. If you don't feed yourself the truth, you become ignorant. And the more ignorant you are, the more lies you believe. The more lies you believe, the more deceived you are. People say, well, he's a Christian. He might be a Christian, but very deceived. Many, many Christians, very deceived people. So nowadays, when I, and we hear ministers and so forth, we're always checking it back with Scripture. Because why? Invariably, you're going to find a bone. What do you do? Bone, throw it out. Don't swallow the bones. Christians are choking on <coughs> bones all the time. You're not going to eat bones in the natural. Don't do it in the spiritual either. Get rid of them. Realize, oh, that's not scriptural. Throw that out. Ooh, that's, boy, that's, that's a bad prophecy. Throw it out. See, so, and we've got to get in here. But the problem is people have more respect for people than they do for the Word of God. Therefore, big name person says something that has got to be God because they said it. No, it doesn't have to be God because they said it. It has to be God if it's in the word, if it lines up with the word. 
But if it's doing harm and it's beating people down and bringing judgment, not God, because that's not what he does. <laughs> Hallelujah. It is so good to serve the Lord. It is so, what a blessing to be in his family. Amen. What a blessing it is to be in his family and to know what we have. And folks, I, in all honesty, I feel like I'm scratching the surface. You know, Paul says, the more, I, the more I know, kind of the less I know. The more I walk in the light, the more I realize, wow, the light, there's a lot of light here, you know, that I need to learn. But I want to learn. As long as I'm in this life, I want to keep growing, learning to be used for his glory. Amen. Father, thank you for your word. Let's just lift our hands a second, Lord. Thank you. We surrender to you. We surrender to your will, which is good. We surrender, Lord, to say, have, have your will in us in all ways. And we thank you, Jesus, for working us that which is your good glory, Lord, to bring glory to your name. Thank you for your blessing and the people in this place and your blessing watching pe people watching online. Even right now, thank you for blessing their homes, their house, their jobs, the work of their hands, their children, their grandchildren. Thank you for blessing them, Jesus. Some that if they don't know you, Father, I thank you for extending your hands of love to them, that even today they would see your light and your goodness. And Jesus, that they would choose to follow you and believe in you and trust in you. Even to say, Lord, reveal yourself to me. Because, <laughs> Lord, we know you will. You're so good. We thank you for your blessings here, Lord. We appreciate so much what you've done for us. And thank you for this New Testament you've given to us, Jesus. We bless your name today in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you say amen? Amen. 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 amen.